Well, we'll see if it continues to work, and if it doesn't, we will fix it. All right, hi, I'm Heidi Helfand. I'm really, really happy to be here. It's my first time in India, and I'm having a fantastic time. I actually met with a friend and coworker that I worked with 20 years ago at a company, and I was so delighted to meet her and to be here and, and to explore your wonderful country. So thank you so much. I'm going to be talking about a topic that I call dynamic reteaming. This is a talk about team change, about when teams change for a variety of reasons. And I call it the art and wisdom of changing teams. It's also the name of a lean pub book that I have, which uh, you can find out about later. Um, but as we get started, how many of you have heard about this model for team development? Raise your hands. Kind of catchy model, Tuckman's model came out in the same, same time frame as Waterfall did, so it's very hot to have linear frameworks, right? Maybe things are a little more of a loop than just forming, storming, norming, performing, adjoining. Um, it's, kind of, it's a useful model. I mean, we get teams together and we want them to gel. We want um, people to work together well, and I think it's been useful. Um, but not many people know that there's actually a missing stage in, in Tuckman's model, and it's a stage called stagnating. And that's when teams are together for too long. Not enough new information comes into the team system. People might be sick of each other. Now, I didn't make this up. This came out as part of the research that I've been doing on team change. And so I'm gonna, let me play a little video for you uh, with a few participants that brought this up. And when they all talked about stagnating, I was like, whoa, this must be a thing. I've been doing this research to derive patterns on team change. I've been interviewing people at different companies for almost a year now. And anyhow, uh, let's see what this means. This is Bryce, and he'll tell us a little bit about stagnation. You just get new perspectives working with different people. And so those, those new ideas, unless you actively have a source of input to your team, like you're reading books together or something, um, it's going to stagnate over time. And so having, having someone else or getting experience working with other teams allows you to bring something new. Even if you're not leaving your team or joining a new team, if you can work with other people periodically, then you have a source of, of input for new ideas. So when you mix it up uh, with completely different people that you've never worked with before, um, and you've actually none of your teammates have ever worked bef to get before either, then you have like really different, um, you know, I mean, even hotkeys, you know, like you're like, oh, I didn't, I didn't know that it was that, you know, key mapping there, <laughs> like, um, the, so there you know, if the team stays stagnant, the abilities you have stay stagnant, mm -hmm. but there we, you know, we have people on the global engineering team for a reason, right? They're good at certain things. They're, they're, they're good team members. And so mixing that up all the time, is important. Yeah, so I was like, whoa, they're all talking about stagnation. Seems like a missing phase in that model. And that's the origin of that slide. Now let's continue. So Brene Brown wrote a book called Daring Greatly. And she uses a research methodology called grounded theory. It's a qualitative research methodology in which she interviews different people, has the interviews transcribed, and codes the transcriptions for themes, she writes about the themes. So she wrote this book, Daring Greatly, and it was about the topic of shame, but she had no idea she was gonna be writing about that topic until she gathered the data. So this was inspiring to me. I thought, um, you know, I would, I would love to dig into the topic of team change in, in greater detail, and so, you know, so far I've, been, I've interviewed about 30 people for about 30 hours, had the interviews transcribed, and so what you'll see in this talk, it's not um, just kind of my, it's not really my random thoughts about the topic, but it's based on this data. I was trained as a linguist, and what we would do in linguistics is we would get data sets from different languages transcribed into the International Phonetic Alphabet, and we'd study that data to derive themes, and we'd write about the patterns that we saw. And so it's kind of what I'm doing here, but with, uh, uh, with people in, t about team change. Um, but I always heard like, in the software industry, and I've been, you know, I've been part of two successful startups for the past 17 years. I've been in the software industry 17 years. Before that, I was a, trained as a teacher. I taught English as a second language. I have a master's in teaching. 
And I always heard, like, keep your teams the same. Heidi, the best teams are the ones that are stable. And I think this has always been, a lot of the times it can be misinterpreted to mean keep your teams the same. Don't change them. And I think, you know, so I got curious about that because I was a part of different companies in which teams changed a lot. And so I think it's different from keeping teams stable as the goal. It's more like, are the, how are the people doing in the teams that they're in? So kind of shifting their perspective a little bit. Are people fulfilled in what they're working on? Are they in the right place right now for the learning that needs to happen for their own development? And is where they're at kind of fit for purpose for what the company needs right now? So we might change teams for fulfillment. This, these are some software engineers on an overnight tech retreat designed to foster relationship building so that later when they change teams, they know each other a bit more. So if you change your teams, you know, you're not doing it wrong. I think it can be the secret to your success. This is a startup I was part of. It went public uh, June 2015. I was the 10th employee. I was with this company from the first team hired as a Scrum Master Agile coach, and I left when the company hit 600 people and went public. So I was with one to 30 teams. And so when people said to me, you know, best practice in Agile, whatever, is to keep the teams the same, I'm like, but wait, we haven't been doing it wrong. This company's a very successful, it's a thriving company. What's going on here? There must be something to it. You know, even though here's a team from that company, and the customers are so delighted with the software that they've delivered that the customers sent them a bouquet of cookies. So there must be something there. <laughs> um, so dynamic reteaming is when you change up the teams. And you know, I view teams as systems. Here's an 80s hair band, Van Halen. Anyone a fan of Van Halen from back in the day? Maybe one of you, two of you. <laughs> Um, one of the team members, uh, band members left and they replaced it with this guy and you could hear it in the sound. The sound was different. Maybe more familiar is this guy. Raise your hand if you know who this is. All right, more, Michael Jackson, right? So uh, one of the other bandmates from, from Van Halen left and he paired up with Michael Jackson to play a very famous guitar riff in a song. Does anybody know the name of the song? Beat it. All right. Maybe uh, that'll be my intro music at a later time. So with dynamic reteaming with team change, I'm not saying let's change up the teams really fast all the time. I'm not suggesting that. I think there's different business rates for reteaming, and it's a business decision. At certain points in a business, you might want to hire a lot of people. I remember at Appfolio, that's a startup I was talking about, we doubled in size more than two years in a row. It was a deliberate business decision to get in all these new people. So we had to integrate them into the team. So there was a, a fast rate of team change. You know, at other times, you know, maybe it was a little bit slower so in, in terms of growth. So you can, you can tune the dial or step on the gas pedal accordingly. And then I think also as individuals, we might prefer different rates of change. And I think that's perfectly valid. You might have a great team that you're on right now the chemistry is great, it's an enjoyable experience, you're delivering incredible things to your customers, your customers are sending you cookies, you know, maybe you have a really great thing going, so you wanna keep it together, that's fine, that's cool. You know, or maybe you're in a situation where, you know, you can't stand working with this person over here and you're ready for a change, you know, that's valid too. So we might have different rates of reteaming. Some colleges have quarter systems or semester systems, shorter or longer, we might have different personal preferences for the rate of team change. A dynamic reteaming, it was kind of accidentally ambiguous when I was thinking about this, because you can reteam the dynamic of a team. If you've ever been on a team, again, and the chemistry isn't quite right, or somebody else might notice it, or maybe a teammate does, team member, you might want to deliberately change up the team. You know, when we have recommendations that we don't like think about critically like, hey, keep your teams the same, keep them stable. Well, it could be doing a disservice to the humans present depending on who's there in the room. So, you know, we have to, I guess, use our common sense and allow teams to change. But I think I haven't seen that as quite so open. I've seen in, you know, from waterfall to agile, maybe we allow more requirements to change or, or other types of changes, but it seems to be like the sacred thing that we have to keep our teams the same. And I don't think that's necessarily the case. 
So we need to tap into how people are feeling in our teams. We can, as managers, as coaches, as good teammates, we can pay attention to how people are doing. Does Joe look like he's miserable every day and, and he might leave the company? We might care about that and say, hey, Joe, how are you doing? And tap into how the people are doing. So they might need a change. And sometimes it might be, depending on the culture of the organization, it might be hard for someone to catalyze their own change. So as managers and as coaches, good team members, we can look out for each other, um, in my opinion, because we want people excited to come to work each day. So I'm not, I'm not saying that reteaming solves every problem, that if you have a problem with the dynamic, instantly break up the team. No, I think you should, like any other challenge we face, we can get curious about it. But I think, you know, it's something to consider. Because I think, you know, in the past, you know, we've heard all this, keep your teams the same, keep your teams the same. You know, but this is a valid option to consider as well. Maybe the team needs to get together like these people and talk about, these people are talking about their toxic team behaviors, whether they blame each other or stonewall each other, which is an interesting exercise. Maybe something like that would help. Maybe a retrospective. Maybe just two team members going out to lunch helps. But, or maybe, you know, the team needs to be retired and people need to be spread amongst other teams. I worked with a team once. The product managers were afraid of the engineers on this team. Nobody wanted to work with that team. There was something there. So then we were like, okay, well, if we break up the team, is it gonna spread that kind of feeling? And it was like a real fear. What are we gonna do? We all wound up reading crucial conversations and doing some activities with that. And that team was together still for a while, but it was, I don't know, I might, maybe we should split them up. So don't mess with geek joy. I think when, when teams have it really good, we want to keep them together. You know, they're, if they're high performing, they're, it's an enjoyable experience, they're building the right things for the customers, the customers are delighted. You know, whatever you consider success, delivering value continuously to your customers, um, you want to, you don't mess with geek joy. So how do companies do this? What are some of the ways? And so this is, these are some stories from the research that I did. I talked with Richard Sheridan, who is the chief storyteller and one of the co-founders of a company called Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, Michigan. And one way that they form teams and reform teams, they do a lot of pairing here, pair programming. Not only the developers pair, but other roles too, even non-developers pair. It's a very rich history of, and, and culture of pairing. So they form teams around the work. They do projects for different companies, more of a consultancy that builds software for different companies. And they actually manage their work on a table. And they, they'll have two people pairing, t talking with the customer. They have these, this role called high-tech anthropologists. They talk to the customers about what the customers need, what the customers want, what they want to build. And in some cases, they will actually switch out whole pairs of people, depending on priority, and put new pairs in. He, Richard wrote a book called Joy Inc., um, which is a very interesting book about their company culture. It is a unique one and inspiring to many um, due to their, their innovative practices. Um, so another company that at the time uh, that I interviewed him, uh, Seth Falcon, VP of engineering at a company called Chef out of Seattle in part, um, they had two-part team formation around work. And what that meant is they'd have a new project that came in, they would do this quarterly, and they'd create, they'd get a software engineer, a product manager, and a UX user experience person together, and they'd create an opportunity canvas, which is something described in the story mapping book by Jeff Patton, if you're familiar with that. And they would look at the type of work that they were gonna build. And then they'd have another stage where they'd add team members that would be beneficial to solving the particular problems that they were going after. So kind of two-part team formation. So it wasn't this, you know, four developers here, one UX person here, one QA member here. They form the teams in, in a different way. So another example of how some teams uh, form. Now this one is, as opposed to having people go to the work, this is some people form teams and then the work comes and gets assigned to the teams. More like maybe that's squad model where the teams might have a mission and work comes to them. This appfolio here uh, with pair programming would have these kind of like a tribe model with tribes and squads, although they named them differently. And so the work initially was assigned to these teams. 
So they'd have like a, a squad like Tesla here with, or a tribe Tesla here with the different squads and then work was assigned to the teams. But then after doing retrospectives, they learned that the developers wanted, the team members wanted more choice in their work. So they converted so the team members select the work from a series of thematic backlogs. So what's the best way, you know, do we do teams pull their own work, work gets pushed to teams, teams formed around the work? You know, I, I don't know what the best way is, but we all have a way that we do it now. So we start where we are and we start reflecting on it, kind of in the spirit of Kanban, we go from there. So this is a team having a retrospective. So feedback loops and retrospectives, I think, are very important, not only in how we work together, but also in our, our team design. So who puts the people on the teams? So Sandy just gave a great talk about self-selected teams. And here's some uh, team members uh, self-selecting for a short-term hack day at Appfolio. You know, it's very high transparency when you're in, a, in an organization when you're able to form your own teams. I think it's very, what as an educator we would call learner-centered. It focuses on the people and what, the, what their needs are. It also inspired, I think, uh, Maria Montessori allowing choice in what we do and where we focus on at work. Of course, it has to be balanced with business goals and everything, but you know, self-selected teams, Sandy's great book. If you wanna learn how to do that, I would recommend reading her book. Um, during reorgs, I talked with Christian Linwall, who's an engineering site lead in San Francisco with Spotify. He works with some infrastructure teams. At one point, so they have this infrastructure tribe with multiple squads, as time went on, each squad has a mission of work. They saw some duplication in missions. And they stepped back and they thought, you know what? We need to kind of redo our missions. And it had an implication to changing the squads. And so what they did was allow the team members to select their squads. And they had this whiteboard that was in one of their hallways. And over a period of a couple of weeks, people could indicate which missions they were interested in. So all, some of the missions stayed the same from before, and there were some new ones added. So you, all the names were taken off, and then they could put themselves up there, have discussions along the way. And then at the end of a couple of weeks, they had this in their fika, or coffee break area. So after a couple of weeks, they had their teams. And I think there was a case here, and I wrote about it in the book, where um, there was one totally uncompelling mission. Nobody really wanted to work on it. And you know what they did? They decided not to work on it. So they moved on. So that's, that was kind of interesting, I thought. So we do have retrospectives on the team compositions. I think that's really, really important. And this leads to another example, Hunter Industries. We've got Woody Zool back here uh, from Hunter, who started the whole mob programming, which we'll, we'll see here. This is a picture of when I visited Hunt, Hunter for the second time. They had multiple mobs. So mob programming where groups of team members are together working on the same thing at the same time. So they, were, they have multiple mobs here. You can see their chairs have wheels. So when I talked with Chris Lucian, their engineering uh, manager, he was telling me stories about how it was pretty fluid. People could move from mob to mob. And since there's multiple people in each mob, it's you know, it felt kind of less disruptive to have one person move to this mob, one person move to that mob. But the team members decided when they did retrospectives was that, you know what, this is going too fast for us. So we need to do something different. And they came up in their retrospective with a trading system. So if I'm working over here on this mob and I want to work over here, if I work it out with a team member on the other mob, we work out a trade, we can do that, and then later we tell the manager. I thought that was kind of fascinating. It was like really putting the, you know, stuff in the hands of the people. So the disappear anti-pattern. So it's, you know, the more I talk to people about reteaming, the more I learn that, you know, in some companies, and there's stories here that, you know, they deliberately change teams as a strategy. You know, we'll see later for sustainability, et cetera. But in some companies, and as, uh, you know, I became a consultant seven months ago or something, uh, you know, sometimes, Reteaming happens and it isn't so great. And one, of, one example is what I call here the disappear anti-pattern. And when I refer to patterns in these, it's because I've seen them at least three times, or the anti-patterns at least three times. 
And this one was pretty upsetting for people. And it was at a quarter, when a quarter would end, um, what would ha it wasn't this, these particular people, but at, when a quarter would end, what would happen is that the priorities would change in the company and people would get reassigned to different pro projects and they wouldn't say goodbye to each other. So it was like, you know, see this guy here, he like just disappeared. It's like proof you're gone. So at the quarter change, some of the team members would be gone because they got reassigned over here. So it was almost like in the company, it had like internal threats to the teams. You know, so this is something that I think is more of an anti-pattern and it was not pleasant for the people. You know, a leader's job, you know, according to Deming, is to drive fear out of the workplace. You know, if you feel safe, we learn from Modern Agile, make safety a prerequisite, feel safe in your work, you know, you feel comfortable to express yourselves, you know. I think if people disappear and they re-team like that without the people's inputs or not in a humanistic way, it, it can be detrimental to the people. So why do we re-team? So d some different reasons that came from the book to you know, grow companies. Also, you know, unfortunately, to shrink companies. Companies lay off people. It's not a pleasant topic to discuss, but it's relevant to this topic. You know, also for sustainability of the company and to keep information redundant in, in your organization. People re-team for learning and fulfillment to liberate people from undesirable situations or teams, and also sometimes we reteam because maybe the code suggests it. So here's some examples about that. This grow and split pattern was really interesting, and I've noticed it at some different startups that I talked to. So this is the initial team at Appfolio that grew big, 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 and then at some point, some of the stand-ups and other things were taking forever too, too long, and it was just too many people. We couldn't make decisions quickly. We split it into two teams. They, these are the teams that emerged, and they you know, named themselves after goofy rock bands with a nerdy twist. So we've got Hex Pistols and Diff Leopard here. You know, but they felt a sense of identity. They were a small company breaking into two teams. And a similar thing happened at a company called Unruly in London. I talked with Rachel Davies, who was telling me some stories about team change. And their first team grew and split as well. And when they actually split, one of the team members baked this cake, and they called it the breaking of the fellowship cake. They're Lord of the Rings fans, and they had this cake together. But it was like a meaningful, emotional event when the companies are small, and they grow like this, and they change. You know, combining teams, so Trade Me, New Zealand, company Sandy was just uh, talking about. I talked to an engineering manager there called William Them, and in, with some teams that he worked with, these were uh, uh, teams that were making some uh, pages responsive, you know, to show up in different mobile apps. They decided that they wanted to do more pair programming and it would be beneficial for them to combine multiple teams together and then do self-selection events where they chose their work and they switched pairs at a regular cadence. So innovation by isolation pattern, this is a pretty exciting one. I, I went to this company the other day, so the, when I said at the beginning of the talk that I, I met a coworker from 20 years ago, it was, we worked on uh, GoToMeeting, GoToWebinar, I was part of that startup. And before we created the GoToMeeting go to related products, we, I was at this startup, I was the 15th employee, and we were trying to create an online marketplace for tech support called the Expert City Marketplace. And so you go to the website and you, you could get tech support help by experts that were standing by to help you. Well, the problem was nobody wanted to buy it. So the company was about to fold. Founder Klaus Sch one of the co-founders, Klaus Schauser, calls it his $10 million mistake. Um, so we had to do something. I was on the web development team. We were told we couldn't work on this anymore. I cried because I was like, wait, we have so many features we want to build. But they were like, you can't work on it. Go to the beach. Don't, you can't. I'm like, what do you mean go to the beach? So, I, so innovation by isolation pattern, these people were taken from different existing teams, put off to the side in isolation. They were given process freedom, and we built a, the first this, this software called Go to My PC. You can see and operate your computer from a distance. We were given process freedom. The rest of the company was doing waterfall at the time. We didn't have to do that. And it was really, really refreshing. So this is a picture from that launch day. And yesterday, I gave a version of this talk to the current GoToMyPC team. And that was really thrilling to me. So 
it's in the Bangalore office here. So this, this happened at another company, which was at Folio, same uh, co-founder, and after they built a property management software application, they decided to build some software like a secure online data, data center, secure online place to store documents and data. Same thing, took multiple team members from other teams, put them off to the side, gave them process freedom. But in this case, these people were not liberated from waterfall, they were liberated from Scrum because they were doing two-week sprints and building a brand new product with the two-week sprints was really holding them back. And they needed really quick iterations. One engineer, I remember saying, like, we didn't know what we were gonna do in an hour. I can't tell you what I'm gonna do two weeks from now. And it would have been really hard to develop this new product in the context of an existing team that worked at that regular cadence. We need a different, complete different cadence. So they isolated themselves. So re another example, reteaming for sustainability. So sometimes people switch teams to combat knowledge silos. This is Jim, he works in Portland, and when he visits, visits some teams in California, visits his company from time to time, once a quarter, he'll be with different teams each time. He was the first engineer at this company, so he shares knowledge of the system. Uh, Cloud Foundry, another uh, company, um, they actually uh, have a history in pairing. They have about 50 teams right now. And they reteam or switch people from team to team as a deliberate strategy for retaining knowledge and for sharing knowledge and doing something. Any of you heard of the book Mythical Man Month? You know, if you add people to a software team, you're going to be late. It's all going to be later. But they try to combat this because what they do is they deliberately switch people from team to team. They wrote software to tell them when to switch people to different teams. So they deliberately do it to sustain the knowledge, spread around the knowledge, get the people to know each other. And then if we need to add a person from this, pro you know, this team, squad, whatever they call it, over here, it's not such a big deal. They're familiar with the environment and all of that. They also find that it increases empathy when they move people from team to team. So this, pro this software allocations, what they use, was developed by Pivotal. I guess when some of the consultants aren't out on a job, they're uh, working on this place called The Beach and they create uh, software pr uh, products there. And so I, I thought this was quite, quite fascinating. So reteaming for flexibility, for knowledge sharing. So reteaming for fulfillment and learning. We've got another video here, which was one of the inspirations for the phrase dynamic reteaming. Eventually you want to rotate people out, but you don't want to rotate everyone out at once, right? And so what we ended up doing is I think every six weeks or every couple sprints or something like that, we would rotate one person out. So three of the team members would say the same, we take one person from another team and we'd rotate people around and eventually the teams would get all mixed up and you'd get that kind of oh, that bigger team mentality because you're working with everybody, right? But, at this, but you're got a, you've got more focus on a smaller team, right? What was that like for you? It was really good because you got, um, you had that momentum with your, your team, right? And you knew what everyone was working on. Communication, we would sit right next to each other. Communication was, you know, was super easy, but then every few weeks you get new blood, you get new ideas, you get new faces, and there are people you see every day in the office, obviously, but, you know, I was on a team, I really like working with Donnie, but Donnie was on another team, but I knew in a couple of weeks, you know, he might be on my team and we could do something new together. Yeah, so I think uh, there's very human reasons for changing teams, Conron explains this very well here when they had one team and the team members were all pairing and the team got really big, there was a lot of pairing variety, which is nice when you're pairing to have a lot of pairing variety. The company, you know, they grew and split and then they had three teams eventually. And just that regular rotation of people from team to team to spread around the knowledge was really done because the, the developers wanted to work with each other. They wanted to work with their friends. Another reteaming example uh, from the research that I did was reteaming to learn a new skill. Like this guy Tushar here wanted to learn about data centers. 
So at this company, they built and maintained their own data centers. And so he was able to switch to another team to learn about that, and then he went back to his other teams. We, I have seen examples of like tech support engineers going to product development teams and sometimes staying. It's nice to have that ability at work. Um, to move from team to team, or even to re-roll. This is another example for, from Menlo, Menlo Innovations in Ann Arbor, uh, Michigan. They enable people, there was a software engineer who wanted to be one of those high-tech anthropologists and do customer-facing UX type work. So how cool is that? Like, wouldn't you want people to stay at your company longer? Wouldn't you want people to be able to try on different hats, wear different hats, try different jobs? You know, I was at two companies for 17 years. It was nice to be able to move from one thing to the next. I got to grow as a person. So I think your organization can be stickier if you not only let people move, you know, from team to team, but also to, you know, try on different roles. So reteaming to free people from misery. If some people have asked me before, Heidi, how do I know if someone needs a reteam? Well, one way is that sometimes if you'll have a team and you notice that like a majority of the team is silent during all your meetings, all your events and other things, maybe that's a sign that you have a new team. Like in this case, this was a, a growing tech support team. And because they shared a manager with that web operations team I was talking about, they had all their combined meetings together. They worked in one week cycles. But after a while, that tech support team grew and then you had this like silent group who didn't want to speak because they thought their stuff wasn't really relevant to what the data center people were talking about. So we split them out. They had their, their new team. They didn't feel like they were wasting their time anymore. And then they got to create the events and meetings or whatever that made sense to them. You know, but sometimes people aren't going to say anything. It might not be like part of the culture to say, hey, I think we have a new team here. But I think the more we talk about this and the more as coaches, as managers, as, as teammates, we notice these things, we can help people in our organizations find the next iteration. You know, our organizations don't have to stay so static. We grow and we kind of morph if we notice, if we take the time to notice. So, you know, these guys are sick of working with each other. We pay attention to the emotional field, and maybe we help them. Look, they've been together for so long, they're wearing the same hats. You know, the dog is sleeping. So let Geek Joy thrive. You know, this is another thing. If it's working really well, leave it together. I have a story uh, from CTO of Appfolio, John Walker, who was talking about he had some, like, like a really amazing high performing team, however he defined it at the time, and there were, there were, the company was about three teams, and he thought, I'm gonna spread the high performance amongst the team, so I'll break up this team in the middle, spread the high performance, and you know, he regretted it. Um, so there's an interesting story in the book about that, and ironically, somebody in another division of the company years later did the same thing and learned the same thing. So that story's there too. So reteaming because the code needs it, so sometimes we might notice that this, this team was working on the first version of their product, but the performance was really terrible. They had to do something before they released it. So they got some team members from multiple teams and put them off to the side. They were in this conference room for two weeks. They solved their performance issues. They called consultants in. They didn't have to work in the regular cycle because they didn't know what, what was gonna happen in the next hour. They had freedom to iterate. And they solved their problem, they went back to their team. So another reteaming example. Nayan Harjot Walla, you can find him at this conference. He said to me once when I presented this in Detroit, Heidi, reteaming is inevitable. You might as well get good at it. And you know, I agree with that because if you think about it, people come and go from your teams, right? They get, you know, they leave your company, they go to a different department, you know, people will come and go. And remember at the beginning I was like, I think you know, teams are systems, so it only takes one person, like that rock band, to have a new team system. If you add a real loud, gregarious person to your team, it's going to feel a lot different than it did before that person joined the team. So, you know, that's a reteam. So we might as well get good at reteaming. You know, so practices to make it easier. So pair programming, that's one for sure. Pair programming and also writing code that, you know, self-testing code, whether it's test-driven or otherwise. It helps facilitate changing teams. If, you know, and in the case of Appfolio, for example, a new person was hired on, remember we doubled in size a couple of years in a row. Whenever a new person was hired, we'd, balance, we'd share the load and they'd get assigned a team and they'd have a mentor. That mentor was their first pair. So if we had 10 people start on the same day, it would impact, 
you know, eight to ten teams, and they'd have mentors, and they'd help them get up to speed by pair programming. You know, mob programming, here's another team. This is a team that mobbed after Woody Zool came and spoke to us in Santa Barbara. That team was, was so excited about mobbing that they did it that afternoon. And so when you mob, you, if you imagine all the redundancy and the knowledge that's with the team, you add a new person into the mix, it's quite different than if everybody codes individually and you add a new person and nobody mentors that person or they have a whole new area they need to learn from scratch, that's going to take a lot longer. So it's facilitated by mobbing and pairing. You know, one-on-ones. Managers can have one-on-ones with people to understand how they're doing. Is Joe excited to come to work every day? Does he need a change? You know, does Mary need a change? You know, really tapping into how we're doing as good teammates uh, is important. I remember as a, as a coach, I would do that. I would try to take people's temperatures, especially when we were a startup because it was risky. We wanted to retain people. We wanted to build this software together. So we, we really cared about how the people were doing. Team coaching is another thing that helps. And I'm not talking about just regular agile rituals. I'm talking about things like from this book. This is an amazing book called Creating Intelligent Teams. Anne Rode and Marita Freejohn. They're from a company. Uh, Marita is co-founder of a wonderful company called CRR, CRR Global. And I did some coach training with them about coaching teams. So we talk about teams as systems, you know, that whole thing with takes one, only one person to make a new team system. There's deliberate ways that you can coach people. And one of them is talking about how do we want to be together as a team? So when I have a team come together and form initially or change later, we do some deliberate things. We, you know, chartering, you know, modern agile, we talk about chartering, getting the teams and the work off to a good start. You know, here we talk about what do we want our team to be like? You know, and this, this team here is a real example. You know, we want to trust each other. We want mutual respect. We want to feel optimistic. This is what this team wanted. But we also talk about when it gets difficult on our team, because it will get difficult. It's normal to have a disagreement. We don't want everybody agreeing with every design we come up with, because then we might not get the best design. You know, so how do, but, but we also might irritate each other sometimes. So how do we want to be with each other when we get upset with each other? So that's a normal human thing. We normalize conflict. So we do stuff like this with teams. And then later we'll look at it again. Is this still valid? You know, that kind of stuff. Rules for living together, for co-located, we talk about uh, how, you know, what do we want our team area to be like, do's and don'ts, just what the preferences are for communication. We do this with remote teams, too. How, when do we want to have our meetings? What communication tools are we going to use, et cetera? We also facilitate activities where people get to know each other. So like in one hour, we can learn about each other and raise respect. This is an activity I learned from Lisa Atkins. It's called Market of Skills. And it's an activity where everybody makes a poster about themselves. These are the skills I bring to the team. These are my hobbies and interests. This is what I want to learn in the next few months, and this is what I can teach, you, teach my teammates. And it raises respect. I had a, a QA engineer join a team once with, a soft, with, a, with some software engineers, and there was one software engineer in particular who was a tough crowd. You really had to earn his respect. We did this activity, and when he learned that the new guy could take apart a motorcycle and put it back together, he couldn't do that himself. He was like, wow, you know, it really raised the respect. And it gives people things to talk about when they run into each other in the office later. This is another good thing to do, like if you have a merger with your company, you have people from one location visiting the other location. You can facilitate this in an hour. I could tell you how to do it. It's, it's really a, one of my favorite things to do. This book has other great ideas, Coaching for Performance. There's a chapter on team coaching that inspired us a lot at Appfolio, talking about things like doing social events together, having potlucks as a team, going on team excursions. You don't need funding to do this. You can do a lot of things for free. Um, but, you know, the other thing, turn on the video. You know, if we're working with our remote teammates from location to location, let's turn the video on. Let's see each other. We'll get to know each other a lot better. Here's when video came. We have a stand up here with some remote friends. We got the video on. We, we, you get to know each other better if you have the video. I was with this team like three weeks ago, okay? Here I am in Santa Barbara. You know, these are not the team members, but 
we were, I'm like, okay, I'll help you test this thing. They had me download this thing on my computer. I'm like, let's hang out and have the video and we'll just talk. Team member in San Francisco, team member in Santa Barbara, I was in Santa Barbara. Suddenly a dog barked. I'm like, oh, Joe, you have a dog. Hold up your dog, let's see what your dog looks like. So he holds up his dog and it's a Pomeranian, right? Then the other guy who he's worked with for five years also had a Pomeranian. And so I'm like, oh, hold up your Pomeranian. These are rare dogs, but these guys worked together for like five years. They didn't know they had the same kind of special breed of dog. And I was like, God, that's really fascinating. Well, you know, turn on that video. You know, who knows what else you'll learn about each other. The other thing, people will leave, so talk about it when they leave. You know, somebody leaves a company, maybe uh, Fred, he leaves the company. Fred was the guy that brought the donuts on Tuesday. Nobody's gonna bring the donuts because Fred left. Do you want somebody else to bring the donuts? Talk about it. There are certain things that we do in our roles that are beyond our job descriptions. Those leave when the people leave our team or leave the company. So we can have deliberate discussions about what do we want to retain, okay? Going through layoffs, we talk about it. I was with another company, it's the elephant in the room. We need to talk about the elephant in the room. I was just, it's been very, very difficult. I was with, with a company and they laid off a lot of people we can't just have the usual stand-up. Oh, what did you do yesterday? No, we have to talk about what's going on. We lost a bunch of team members in our office. We need to talk about this thing. This is a reteaming when people get laid off. It's not pleasant, but we need to talk about it as people because it's, it, it's just a difficult situation. You know, encourage connection. When we visit each other's office locations, you know, across different locations, Introduce yourself to people. You know, if you merge with another company, I was involved in a company merger recently, I found the Agile people at the different locations and sent them an email, hey, let's have a phone call. Somebody else asked me, how did you get to know these people? I just like sent them an email. You know, so we reach out and encourage the connection, helps with the reteaming. Remote office gatherings, here's a company called Meltwater. They bring coaches from all over the world. They brought them to Berlin and had an event together so they could know each other as people in person, and then they go to their remote locations. You know, some people do sports together. So the reteaming, it's gonna happen, so how do you respond to it? You know, these guys decided to push the broken down uh, VW van when it broke. They decided to do that, so how will you respond? So you get to choose. Um, I hope this was helpful. My name is Heidi Helfand. I'd love to hear from you, and here's my contact information, and thanks so much. Might have time for a qu couple questions. Anyone have a question? So the question is, what's the average time frame to change teams? Now I've heard, I've heard maybe six months, some teams nine months, but it really kind of depends. Um, some teams reteam quarterly, some teams stay together for a very long time. So I think you really have to look at the particular team. If it's doing, real, if the team is doing great, they're delivering things that cu the customers actually want, that delight the customers. You want to keep them together. So I don't think there's a hard and fast rule. Yeah? Yeah. Yeah, so the question is, if people change teams, maybe there's a hit to the productivity. So how do we handle that? You know, so there are certain things that we can do, you know, to add redundancy to the situation, such as pairing, such as having tests when someone goes and works on a new area of code, you know, they can, you know, they can leverage the tests there to get the feedback. Um, so it makes it easier for them to reteam. It's harder to reteam if you're switching programming languages. That'll be even more of a setback. I think if we have tr like a tribe structure or communities of teams and they get to know each other, 
it makes it easier to mix because at least on a social level, the people don't need to break the ice, so then that makes it easier. You know, at the end of the day, we, you know, what is productivity? You know, and to me, it's kind of like, are we building the right things and getting them out to the customers at the cadence that's acceptable for the customer and the business? And so, you know, we got to watch that. We also, you know, re-teaming around the edges. You know, breaking up a big, you know, having a lot of change at the same time will be a lot, you know, more of an impact than maybe having one team member move over here might not necessarily have that much of an impact. You know, if it's a brand new team member coming into the company, they don't have any domain knowledge yet, it'll be a bigger hit. You know, if, there are, if they've been there for years, they know the people, the same programming language, they switch, it'll be less of an impact. So. Okay. Thank you very much. <laughs>